From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, we bring you the General Women's Session of the 188th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Music for this session is provided by a choir of young women from Stakes in the Pleasant Grove, Utah area. Jean B. Bingham, Relief Society General President, will conduct this session. Dear sisters, wherever you are in the world and whatever your age, our hearts are knit together in a great sisterhood. We welcome you to this historic General Women's Session of the 188th Semi-Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We are grateful to be gathered in the Conference Center here in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we know that there are similar gatherings of sisters in meeting places throughout the world. We likewise welcome and acknowledge friends from other faiths who may be joining us and hope you enjoy our time together. President Russell M. Nelson has invited me to conduct this session. My name is Jean Bingham, and I currently serve as Relief Society General President. We are delighted to have President Nelson and the other members of the First Presidency in attendance this evening and look forward to receiving counsel from them. We gratefully acknowledge the presence of members of the Priesthood and Family Executive Council who serve with the Sisters. Also seated on the stand are those serving the primary, Young Women and Relief Society General Presidencies. We extend a warm welcome to them and to the general board members of each organization, many of whom are newly called. The music for this session will be provided by a choir of young women from stakes in the Pleasant Grove, Utah area, under the direction of Tracy Warby, with Bonnie Goodliffe at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing, Come, Ye Children of the Lord. The invocation will then be offered by Sister Memnet Lopez, who serves on the Relief Society General Board, after which the choir will sing, This is the Christ.
Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for enabling us to congregate worldwide in unity as daughters in thy kingdom. We invoke the outpouring of thy spirit that we might receive spiritual nourishment with renewed conviction of righteousness. Magnify our desire to not only receive, but to act upon our individual personal revelation that will come to us. Bless us and those we love that we would cleave unto our covenants with thee. Remove our fear and doubt, fortify our faith, increase our trust and hope in thee and in thy Son, that we might move forward, empowered to face the challenges in our lives. Bless those who are suffering from natural disasters and conflicts, and those who mourn. Lift their spirits and speak peace and hope to their souls. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, choir, for that beautiful music sharing your testimonies of the Savior through song. We will now be pleased to hear from Sister Joy D. Jones, who serves as primary general president. She will be followed by Sister Michelle Craig, 
first counselor in the Young Women General Presidency, and Sister Christina B. Franco, second counselor in the Primary General Presidency. On this historic night, I express my love and appreciation to each of you, my dear sisters. Whatever our age, location, or circumstance, we gather tonight in unity, in strength, in purpose, and in testimony that we are loved and led by our Heavenly Father, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and our living prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. As a young couple, my husband and I were called by our bishop to visit and minister to a family who hadn't been to church in many years. We willingly accepted the assignment and went to their home a few days later. It was immediately clear to us that they did not want visitors from the church. So on our next visit, we approached them with a plate of cookies, confident that chocolate chips would melt their hearts. <laughs> they didn't. The couple spoke to us through the screen door, making it even clearer that we weren't welcome. But as we drove home, we were fairly certain success might have been achieved had we only offered them Rice Krispie treats instead. <laughs> Our lack of spiritual vision made additional failed attempts frustrating. Rejection is never comfortable. Over time, we began to ask ourselves, why are we doing this? What is our purpose? Elder Carl B. Cook made this observation, quote, Serving in the church can be challenging if we are asked to do something that frightens us, if we grow weary of serving, or if we are called to do something that we do not initially find appealing, end quote. We were experiencing the truth of Elder Cook's words when we decided we had to seek direction from someone with a greater perspective than our own. So after much sincere prayer and study, we received the answer to the why of our service. We had a change of understanding, a change of heart, actually a revelatory experience. As we sought direction from the scriptures, the Lord taught us how to make the process of serving others easier and more meaningful. Here is the verse we read that changed both our hearts and our approach. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, mind, and strength. And in the name of Jesus Christ, thou shalt serve him. Though this verse was so familiar, it seemed to speak to us in a new and important way. We realized that we were sincerely trying to, striving to serve this family, and we wanted to serve our bishop. But we had to ask ourselves if we were really serving out of love for the Lord. King Benjamin made clear this distinction when he stated, Behold, I say unto you that because I said unto you that I had spent my days in your service, I do not desire to boast, for I have only been in the service of God. So whom was King Benjamin really serving? Heavenly Father and the Savior knowing the who and the why in serving others helps us understand that the highest manifestation of love is devotion to god as our focus gradually changed so did our prayers we began looking forward to our visits with this dear family because of our love for the lord we were doing it for him he made the struggle no longer a struggle after many months of our standing on the doorstep, the family began letting us in. Eventually, we had regular prayer and sweet gospel discussions together. A long-lasting friendship developed. We were worshiping and loving Him by loving His children. Can you think back on a time when you lovingly reached out with sincere effort to help someone in need and felt that your efforts went unnoticed or perhaps were unappreciated or even unwanted? In that moment, did you question the value of your service? If so, 
May the words of King Benjamin replace your doubt and even your hurt. Ye are only in the service of your God. Rather than building resentment, we can build through service a more perfect relationship with our Heavenly Father. Our love and devotion to Him preempts the need for recognition or appreciation and allows His love to flow to and through us. Sometimes we may initially serve from a sense of duty or obligation, but even that service can lead us to draw on something higher within us, leading us to serve in a more excellent way, as in President Nelson's invitation to, quote, a newer, holier approach to caring for and ministering to others, end quote. When we focus on all that God has done for us, our service flows from a heart of gratitude. As we become less concerned about our serv service magnifying us, we realize instead that the focus of our service will be on putting God first. President M. Russell Ballard taught, quote, it is only when we love God and Christ with all of our hearts, souls, and minds that we are able to share this love with our neighbors through acts of kindness and service." End quote. The first of the Ten Commandments reiterates this divine wisdom, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The placement of this commandment helps us understand that if we place Him as our main priority, everything else will ultimately fall into place, even our service to others. When He takes the preeminent position in our lives by our deliberate choice, then He is able to bless our actions to our good and to the good of others. The Lord counseled, look unto me in every thought. And each week we covenant to do just that, to always remember Him. Can such a godly focus apply in everything we do? Can performing even a menial task become an opportunity to demonstrate our love and devotion to Him? I believe it can, sisters, and will. We can make each item on our to-do list become a way to glorify Him. We can see each task as a privilege and opportunity to serve Him, even when we are in the midst of deadlines, duties, or dirty diapers. As Ammon said, Yea, I know that I am nothing. As to my strength, I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself, but I will boast of my God. For in His strength, I can do all things. When serving our God becomes our main priority in life, we lose ourselves. And in due course, we find ourselves. The Savior taught this principle so simply and directly. Therefore, let your light so shine before this people that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. May I share with you some words of wisdom that were found on the wall of an orphanage in Calcutta, India. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you've got anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it is between you and your God anyway. Sisters, it is always between us and the Lord. As President James E. Faust said, quote, What is the greatest need in the world? Is not the greatest need in all of the world for every person to have a personal, ongoing, daily, continuing relationship with the Savior? Having such a relationship can unchain the divinity within us, and nothing can make a greater difference in our lives as we come to know and understand 
our divine relationship with God." End quote. Similarly, Alma explained to his son, Yea, let all thy doings be unto the Lord, and whithersoever thou goest, let it be in the Lord. Yea, let all thy thoughts be directed unto the Lord. Yea, let the affections of thy heart be placed upon the Lord forever. And President Russell M. Nelson has likewise taught us, quote, when we comprehend his voluntary atonement, any sense of sacrifice on our part becomes completely overshadowed by a profound sense of gratitude for the privilege of serving him, end quote. Sisters, I testify that when Jesus Christ, through the power of his atonement, works on us and in us, he begins to work through us to bless others. We serve them, but we do so by loving and serving him. We become what the scripture describes, every man and woman seeking the interest of his neighbor and doing all things with an eye single to the glory of God. Maybe our bishop knew that was the lesson my husband and I would learn from those early and well-intentioned, yet not perfect, efforts to minister to his beloved sons and daughters. I bear my personal and sure witness of the goodness and love he shares with us, even as we strive to serve for him. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. When I was in elementary school, we walked home on a paved trail that wound back and forth up the side of a hill. There was another trail, unpaved, called the Boys' Trail. The Boys' Trail was a path in the dirt that went straight up the hill. It was shorter but much steeper. As a young girl, I knew I could walk up any trail the boys could. More important, I knew I was living in the latter days and that I would need to do hard things as did the pioneers, and I wanted to be prepared. So every now and then, I would lag behind my group of friends on the paved trail, remove my shoes, and walk barefoot up the boys' trail. I was trying to toughen up my feet. As a young primary girl, that is what I thought I could do to prepare. Now I know differently. Rather than walking barefoot up mountain trails, I know I can prepare my feet to walk on the covenant path by responding to the invitations of the Holy Ghost. For the Lord, through his prophet, is calling each of us to live and care in a higher and holier way and to take a step higher. These prophetic calls to action, coupled with our innate sense that we can do and be more, sometimes create within us what Elder Neil A. Maxwell called divine discontent. Divine discontent comes when we compare what we are to what we have the power to become. Each of us, if we are honest, feels a gap between where and who we are and where and who we want to become. We yearn for greater personal capacity. We have these feelings because we are daughters and sons of God born with the light of Christ, yet living in a fallen world. These feelings are God-given and create an urgency to act. We should welcome feelings of divine discontent that call us to a higher way while recognizing and avoiding Satan's counterfeit, paralyzing discouragement. This is a precious space into which Satan is all too eager to jump. We can choose to walk the higher path that leads us to seek for God and His peace and grace, or we can listen to Satan, who bombards us with mis messages that we will never be enough, rich enough, smart enough, beautiful enough, anything enough. Our discontent can become divine or destructive. One way to tell divine discontent from Satan's counterfeit 
is that divine discontent will lead us to faithful action. Divine discontent is not an invitation to stay in our comfort zone, nor will it lead us to despair. I have learned that when I wallow in thoughts of everything I am not, I do not progress, and I find it much more difficult to feel and follow the Spirit. As a young man, Joseph Smith became keenly aware of his shortcomings and worried about the welfare of his immortal soul. In his words, My mind became exceedingly distressed, for I became convicted of my sins and felt to mourn for my own sins and for the sins of the world. This led him to serious reflection and great uneasiness. Does this sound familiar? Are you uneasy or distressed by your shortcomings? Well, Joseph did something. He shared, I often said to myself, what is to be done? Joseph acted in faith. He turned to the scriptures, read the invitation in James 1.5, and turned to God for help. The resulting vision ushered in the restoration. How grateful I am that Joseph's divine discontent, his period of unease and confusion, spurred him to faithful action. The world often uses a feeling of discontent as an excuse for self-absorption for turning our thoughts inward and backward and dwelling individually on who I am, who I am not, and what I want. Divine discontent motivates us to follow the example of the Savior who went about doing good. As we walk the path of discipleship, we will receive spiritual nudges to reach out to others. A story I heard years ago has helped me recognize and then act on promptings from the Holy Ghost. Sister Bonnie Parkin, former Relief Society General President, shared the following. Susan was a wonderful seamstress. President Kimball lived in her ward. One Sunday, Susan noticed that he had a new suit. Her father had recently brought her some exquisite silk fabric. Susan thought that fabric would make a handsome tie to go with President Kimball's new suit. And so on Monday, she made the tie. She wrapped it in tissue paper and walked up the block to President Kimball's home. On her way to the front door, she suddenly stopped and thought, who am I to make a tie for the prophet? He probably has plenty of them. Deciding that she had made a mistake, she turned to leave. Just then, Sister Kimball opened the front door and said, oh, Susan. Stumbling all over herself, Susan said, I saw President Kimball in his new suit on Sunday. Dad just brought me some silk from New York, and so I made him a tie. Before Susan could continue, Sister Kimball stopped her, took hold of her shoulders, and said, Susan, never suppress a generous thought. I love that. Never suppress a generous thought. Sometimes when I have an impression to do something for someone, I wonder if it was a prompting or just my own thoughts. But I am reminded that that which is of God inviteth and enticeth to do good continually. Wherefore, everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve Him is inspired of God. Whether they are direct promptings or just impulses to help, a good deed is never wasted for charity never faileth and is never the wrong response. Often the timing is inconvenient, and we seldom know the impact of our small acts of service. But every now and then we will recognize that we have been instruments in the hands of God, and we will be grateful to know that the Holy Ghost working through us is a manifestation of God's approval. Sisters. You and I can plead for the Holy Ghost to show us all things what we should do, even when our to-do list already looks full. When prompted, we can leave dishes in the sink or an inbox full of challenges demanding attention in order to read to a child, visit with a friend, babysit a neighbor's children, or serve in the temple. Don't get me wrong, I am a list maker. I love checking things off. But peace comes in knowing that being more does not necessarily equate to doing more. 
Responding to discontent by resolving to follow promptings changes the way I think about my time, and I see people not as interruptions but as the purpose of my life. Divine discontent leads to humility, not to self-pity or the discouragement that comes from making comparisons in which we always come up short. Covenant-keeping women come in all sizes and shapes. Their families and life experiences and circumstances vary. Of course, all of us will fall short of our divine potential, and there is some truth in the realization that alone we are not enough. But the good news of the gospel is that with the grace of God, we are enough. With Christ's help, we can do all things. The scriptures promise that we will find grace to help in time of need. The surprising truth is that our weaknesses can be a blessing when they humble us and turn us to Christ. Discontent becomes divine when we humbly approach Jesus Christ with our want rather than hold back in self-pity. In fact, Jesus' miracles often began with the recognition of want, need, failure, or inadequacy. Remember the loaves and fishes? Each of the Gospel writers tell how Jesus miraculously fed the thousands who followed him. But the story begins with the disciples' recognition of their lack. They realize they have only five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? The disciples were right. They didn't have enough food. But they gave what they had to Jesus, and then He provided the miracle. Have you ever felt your gifts and talents were too small for the task ahead? I have. But you and I can give what we have to Christ, and He will multiply our efforts. What you have to offer is more than enough, even with your human frailties and weaknesses, if you rely on the grace of God. The truth is that each one of us is one generation away from deity, a child of God, and just as he has done with both prophets and ordinary men and women through the ages, so Heavenly Father intends to transform us. C.S. Lewis explained God's transforming power this way. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that those things needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house and about in a way that hurts abominably. You see, he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself." Close quote. Because of our Savior's atoning sacrifice, we can be made equal to the tasks that lie ahead. The prophets have taught that as we climb the path of discipleship, we can be sanctified through the grace of Christ. Divine discontent can move us to act in faith, follow the Savior's invitations to do good, and give our lives humbly to Him. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. After last general conference, many people approached me with the same question. Are those chairs comfortable? <laughs> My answer was the same every time. Those chairs are very comfortable if you don't have to speak. <laughs> it's true, right? <laughs> My chair has not been as comfortable this conference, but I am truly grateful for the blessing and the honor of speaking to you this evening. Sometimes, as we serve, we get to sit in different seats. Some are quite comfy, and some other ones are not. But we have promised our Father in Heaven that we will serve Him and others with love and do His will in all things. A few years ago, youth in the Church learned that when you embark in the service of God, 
You are joining the greatest journey ever. You are helping God hasten His work, and it's a great, joyful, and marvelous experience. It's a journey available to all of any age, and it's also a journey that takes us along what our beloved prophet has spoken of as the covenant path. Unfortunately, however, we live in a selfish world where people constantly ask, what's in it for me? Instead of asking, whom can I help today? Or how can I better serve the Lord in my calling? Or am I giving my all to the Lord? A great example in my love life of unselfish service is Sister Victoria Antonietti. Victoria was one of the primary teachers in my branch while I was growing up in Argentina. Each Tuesday afternoon, when we gathered for primary, she brought us a chocolate cake. Everyone loved the cake. Well, everyone except me. I hated chocolate cake. And even though she would try to share the cake with me, I always turned down her offer. One day, after she had shared the chocolate cake with the rest of the children, I asked her, why don't you bring a different flavor like orange or vanilla? <laughs> I know. After laughing a little, she asked me, why don't you try a little piece? This cake is made with a special ingredient and I promise that if you try it, you will like it. I looked around, and to my surprise, everyone seemed to be enjoying the cake. So I agreed to give it a try. Can you guess what happened? I liked it. That was the very first time I had enjoyed chocolate cake. It wasn't until many years later that I found out what the secret ingredient was in Sister Antonietti's chocolate cake. My children and I visited my mother each week. On one of these visits, mom and I were enjoying a slice of chocolate cake, and I related to her how I came to like the, ch the cake for the very first time. Then she enlightened me with the rest of the story. You see, Chris, my mom said, Victoria and her family didn't have a lot of resources, and each week she had to choose between paying for the bus to take her and her four children to primary or buying the ingredients to make the chocolate cake for her primary class. She always chose the chocolate cake over the bus. And she and her children walked more than two miles each way, regardless of the weather. That day, I had a better appreciation for her chocolate cake. More important, I learned that the secret ingredient in Victoria's cake was the love that she had for those she served and her unselfish sacrifice in our behalf. Thinking back on Victoria's cake helps me remember an unselfish sacrifice and the timeless lessons taught by the Lord to his disciples as he walked toward the treasury of the temple. You know the story. James, Elder James E. Talmage taught that there were 13 chests, and into these chests the people dropped their contributions for the different purposes indicated by the inscriptions on the boxes. Jesus watched the lines of the honors made, of, made up of all different types of people. Some give their gifts with sincerity of purpose, while others cast in great sums of silver and gold, hoping to be seen, noticed, and praised for their donations. Among the many was a poor widow who dropped into one of the treasure chests two small bronze coins known as mites. Her contribution amounted to less than half a cent in American money. The Lord called his disciples about him, directed their attention to the poverty-stricken widow and her deed, and said, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, 
but she over want that cast in all that she had, even all of her living. The widow did not appear to hold a noticeable position in the society of her time. She actually held something more important. Her intentions were pure. She and she gave all she had to give. Perhaps she gave less than others, more quietly than others, differently than others. In the eyes of some, what she gave was insignificant. But in the eyes of the Savior, the discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart, she gave her all. Sisters, are we giving our all to the Lord without reservations? Are we sacrificing of our time and talents so the rising generation can learn to love the Lord and keep His commandments? Are we ministering both to those around us and to those we are assigned with care and with diligence, sacrificing time and energy that could be used in other ways? Are we living the two great commandments to love God and to love His children? Often, that love is manifest as service. President Dalin H. Chokes taught, Our Savior gave Himself in unselfish service. He taught that each of us should follow Him by denying ourselves of selfish interests in order to serve others. He continued, A familiar example of losing ourselves in the service of others is the sacrifice parents make for their children. Mothers suffer pain and loss of personal priorities and comforts to bear and rear each child. Fathers adjust their lives and priorities to support a family. We also rejoice in those who care for disabled family members and aged parents. None of this service asked what's in it for me. All of it requires setting aside personal convenience for unselfish service. And all of it, all of this illustrates the eternal principle that we are happier and more fulfilled when we act and serve for what we give, not for what we get. Our Savior teaches us to follow Him by making the sacrifices necessary to lose ourselves in unselfish service to others. President Thomas S. Monson likewise that, that perhaps when we make face-to-face -face contact with our Maker, we will not be asked, how many positions did you hold, but rather, how many people did you help? In reality, you can never love the Lord until you serve Him by serving His people. In other words, sisters, it will not matter if we sat in the comfy seats or if we struggled to get through the meeting on a rusting folding chair in the back row. It won't even matter if we, of necessity, stepped into a foyer to comfort a crying baby. What will matter is that we came with a desire to serve, that we noticed those to whom we minister and greeted them joyfully and that we introduce ourselves to those sharing our roof of folding chairs, reaching out with friendship even though we aren't assigned to minister to them. And it will certainly matter that we do all that we do with the special ingredient of service coupled with love and sacrifice. I have come to know that we don't have to make a chocolate cake to be a successful and dedicated primary teacher because it was not about the cake. It was the love behind the action. I testify that that love is made sacred through sacrifice, the sacrifice of a teacher, and even more through the ultimate and eternal sacrifice of the Son of God. I bear witness that He lives I love him and desire to put away selfish desires in order to love and minister as he does. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, dear sisters. The congregation will now join the choir in singing 
now let us rejoice. After the singing, we will be pleased to hear from President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the First Presidency. He will be followed by President Dallin H. Oaks, who serves as first counselor in the First Presidency. My beloved sisters, it is wonderful to meet with you. This is an exciting time in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Lord is pouring out knowledge on His Church as He promised that He would. You remember what He said, How long can rolling waters remain impure? What power shall stay the heavens? as well man might stretch forth his puny arm to stop the Missouri River in its decreed course or to turn it upstream as to hinder the Almighty from pouring down knowledge from heaven upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. Part of the Lord's current sharing of knowledge 
relates to accelerating his pouring out eternal truth on the heads and into the hearts of his people. He has made clear that the daughters of Heavenly Father will play a primary role in that miraculous acceleration. One evidence of the miracle is his leading his living prophet to put far greater emphasis on gospel instruction in the home and within the family. Now you might ask, how does that make faithful sisters a primary force to help the Lord pour out knowledge on his saints? The Lord gives the answer in the family proclamation to the world. You remember the words, but you may see new meaning and recognize that the Lord foresaw these exciting changes which are now occurring. In the proclamation, he gave the sisters charged to be the principal gospel educators in the family in these words, open quote, mothers are primarily responsible for the nurture of their children, close quote. This includes the nurture of gospel truth and knowledge. The proclamation, of course, goes on. Fathers and mothers are obligated to help one another as equal partners. They are equal partners, equal in their potential for spiritual growth and for acquiring knowledge, and so are unified by helping each other. They are equal in their divine destiny to be exalted together. In fact, men and women cannot be exalted alone. Why then does a daughter of God in a united and equal relationship receive the primary responsibility to nourish with the most important nutrient all must receive, a knowledge of truth coming from heaven? As nearly as I can see, that has been the Lord's way since families were created in this world. For instance, it was Eve who received the knowledge that Adam needed to partake of the fruit of the tree of knowledge for them to keep all of God's commandments and to form a family. I, don't know, I do not know why it came to Eve first, but Adam and Eve were perfectly united when the knowledge was poured out on Adam. Another example of the Lord's using the nurturing gifts of women is the way he strengthened the sons of Helaman. <laughs> I get a lump in my throat when I read the account and remember my own mother's quiet words of assurance as I left home for military service. Helaman recorded, open quote, they had been taught by their mothers that if they did not doubt, God would deliver them. And they rehearsed unto me the words of their mothers, saying, we do not doubt our mothers knew it. While I do not know all the Lord's reasons for giving primary responsibility for nurturing in the family to faithful sisters, I believe it has to do with your capacity to love. It takes great love to feel the needs of someone else more than your own. That is the pure love of Christ for the person you nurture. That feeling of charity comes from the person chosen to be the nurturer, having qualified for the effects of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The motto of the Relief Society, which my own mother exemplified, seems to me inspired. Charity never faileth. As daughters of God, you have an innate and great capacity to sense the needs of others and to love. That in turn makes you more susceptible to the whisperings of the Spirit. That Spirit can then guide what you think, what you say, and what you do to nurture people so the Lord may pour knowledge, truth, and courage upon them. 
You sisters hearing my voice tonight are each in a unique place in your journey through life. Some are young girls in a general women's session for the first time. Some are young women preparing to be the nurturers God would have them be. Some are newly married who have not yet had children. Others are young mothers with one or more. Some are mothers of teenagers and others with children in the mission field. Some have children who have become weakened in faith and are far from home. Some live alone with no faithful companion. Some are grandmothers. Yet whatever your personal circumstance, you are part, a key part, of the family of God and of your own family, whether in the future, in this world, or in the spirit world. Your trust from God is to nurture as many of His and your family members as you can with your love and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Your practical challenge is to know whom to nurture and how and when. Well, you need the Lord's help. He knows others' hearts, and He knows when they are ready to accept your nurturing. Your prayer of faith will be your key to success. You can depend upon receiving His guidance. He gave this encouragement, quote, Ask the Father in my name in faith, believing that you shall receive, and you shall have the Holy Ghost, which will manifest all things which are expedient, close quote. In addition to prayer, serious study of the scriptures will be part of your growing power to nurture. Here is the promise, open quote, take ye th neither take ye thought beforehand what ye shall say, but treasure up in your minds continually the words of life, and it shall be given you in the very hour that portion that shall be meted under, under every man." Close quote. So you will take more time to pray, to ponder, and to meditate on spiritual matters. You will have knowledge of truth poured out upon you and grow in your power to nurture others in your family. There will be times when you feel that your progress in learning how better to nurture is slow, it will take faith to endure. He sent you this encouragement. Wherefore, be not weary in well-doing, for ye are laying the foundation of a great work, and out of small things proceedeth that which is great. Behold, the Lord requireth the heart and a willing mind, and the willing and obedient shall eat the good of the land of Zion in these last days." Close quote. Your very presence tonight is evidence that you are willing to accept the Lord's invitation to nurture others. That is true even for the youngest here tonight. You can know whom to nurture in your family. If you pray with real intent, a name or a face will come to your mind. That could happen tonight. If you pray to know what to do or what to say, you will feel an answer. Each time you obey, your power to nurture will grow. You will be preparing for the day when you will nurture your own children. Mothers of teenagers could pray to know how to nurture a son or a daughter who seems unresponsive to your nurturing. You might ask to know who could have the spiritual influence your child needs and would accept. God hears and answers such heartfelt prayers of worried mothers, and so He sends them help. Also, our grandmother here may tonight may feel heartache caused by the strains and difficulties of her children and grandchildren. You might take courage and direction from the experiences of families in the scriptures. From the time of Eve and Adam, through Father Israel and on to every family in the Book of Mormon, there is one sure lesson about what to do about the sorrows of unresponsive children. 
never stop loving. We have the encouraging example of the Savior as he nourished the rebellious spirit children of his heavenly Father. Even when they and we had caused pain, the Savior's hand is still outstretched. He spoke in 3 Nephi of his spiritual sisters and brothers whom he had tried unsuccessfully to nurture. Open quote, O ye people who are of the house of Israel, how aft have I gathered you as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings and have nourished you. For sisters in every stage of life's journey, in every family situation, and across every culture, the Savior is your perfect example of how you will play a major part in his move to play, place greater emphasis on gospel learning in the home and family. You will bring your inherent, inherent feeling of charity into changes and activities and practices in your family. That will bring greater spiritual growth. When you pray with and for family members, you will feel your and the Savior's love for them. That will become more and more your spiritual gift as you seek it. Your family members will feel it as you pray with greater faith. When the family gathers to read scriptures aloud, you will already have read them and prayed over them to prepare yourself. You will have found moments to pray for the Spirit to enlighten your mind. Then when it is your turn to read, family members will feel your love for God and for His Word. They will be nurtured by Him and by His Spirit. That same outpouring can come in any family gathering if you pray and plan for it. It may take effort and time, but it will bring miracles. I remember a lesson my mother taught when I was little. I can still see in my mind the colored map she had made of the travels of the Apostle Paul. I wonder how she found the time and energy to do that. And to this day, I am blessed by her love for that faithful apostle as I now serve among apostles. You will each find ways to contribute to the outpouring of truth upon your families in the Lord's restored church. Each of you will pray, study, and ponder to know what your unique contribution will be. But this I know, each of you equally yoked with sons of God will be a major part of a miracle of gospel learning and living that will hasten the gathering of Israel and will prepare God's family for the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. My dear sisters, how wonderful to have this new general conference session of women of the church, eight years and older. We've heard inspiring messages from the sister presidents and from President Eyring. President Eyring and I love working under the direction of President Russell M. Nelson, and we look forward to his prophetic address. Children are our most precious gift from God, our eternal increase. Yet we live in a time when many women wish to have no part in the bearing and nurturing of children. Many young adults delay marriage until temporal needs are satisfied. The average age of our church members' marriages has increased by more than two years, and the number of births to church members is falling. The United States and some other nations face a future of too few children maturing into adults to support the number of retiring adults. Over 40% of births in the United States are to unwed mothers. Those children are vulnerable. Each of these trends works against our Father's divine plan of salvation. Latter-day Saint women understand that being a mother is their highest priority, their ultimate joy. President Gordon B. Hinckley said, Women, for the most part, see their greatest fulfillment, their greatest happiness in home and family. 
God planted within women something divine that expresses itself in quiet strength, in refinement, in peace, in goodness, in virtue, in truth, in love. And all of these remarkable qualities find their truest and most satisfying expression in motherhood. He continued, the greatest job that any woman will ever do will be in nurturing and teaching and living and encouraging and rearing her children in righteousness and truth. There is no other thing that will compare with that regardless of what she does." End of quote. Mothers, beloved sisters, we love you for who you are and what you do for all of us. In his important 2015 address titled, A Plea to My Sisters, President Russell M. Nelson said, the kingdom of God is not and cannot be complete without women who make sacred covenants and then keep them, women who can speak with the power and authority of God. Today we need women who know how to make important things happen by their faith and who are courageous defenders of morality and families in a sin-sick world. We need women who are devoted to shepherding God's children along the covenant path toward exaltation, women who know how to receive personal revelation, who understand the power and peace of the temple endowment, women who know how to call upon the powers of heaven to protect and strengthen children and families, women who teach fearlessly." End of quote. These inspired teachings are all based on the family, a proclamation to the world, in which this restored church reaffirms doctrine and practices central to the Creator's plan before He created the earth. Now I address the younger group of this audience. My dear young sisters, because of your knowledge of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, you are unique. Your knowledge will enable you to endure and overcome the difficulties of growing up. From a young age, you've participated in projects and programs that have developed your talents, such as writing, speaking, and planning. You've learned responsible behavior and how to resist temptations to lie, cheat, steal, or use alcohol or drugs. Your uniqueness was recognized in a University of California, of University of North Carolina study of American teens and religion. A Charlotte Observer article had the title, quote, Mormon Teens Cope Best study finds they top peers at handling adolescence." End of quote. This article concluded that, quote, Mormons fared best at avoiding risky behaviors, doing well in school, and having a positive attitude about the future. One of the researchers in the study who interviewed most of our youth said, quote, Across almost every category we looked at, there was a clear pattern. Mormons were first, end of quote. Why do you cope best with the difficulties of growing up? Young women, it is because you understand our Heavenly Father's great plan of happiness. This tells you who you are and the purpose of your life. Youth with that understanding are first in problem solving and first in choosing the right. You know you can have the Lord's help in overcoming all the difficulties of growing up. Another reason why you are the most effective is that you understand that you are children of a Heavenly Father who loves you. I'm sure you're familiar with our great hymn, Dearest Children, God is Near You. Here's the first verse we have all sung and believed. Dearest children, God is near you, watching o'er you day and night, and delights to own and bless you if you strive to do what's right. There are two teachings in that verse. 
First, our Heavenly Father is near us and watches over us day and night. Think of it. God loves us, He is near to us, and He watches over us. Second, He delights to bless us as we strive to do what's right. What comfort in the midst of our anxieties and difficulties. Yes, young women, you are blessed, you are wonderful, but you're like all of Heavenly Father's children in your need to strive to do what's right. Here I could give you counsel on many different things, but I've chosen to speak of only two. My first counsel concerns cell phones. A recent nationwide survey found that over half of teens in the United States said they spend too much time on their cell phones. More than 40% said they felt anxious when they were separated from their cell phones. This was more common among girls than boys. My young sisters and adult women too. <laughs> it will bless your lives if you limit your use of and dependence on cell phones. My second counsel is even more important. Be kind to others. Kindness is something many of our youth are doing already. Some groups of youth in some communities have shown the way for all of us. We've been inspired by our young people's acts of kindness to those in need of love and help. In many ways, you give that help and show that love to one another. We wish all would follow your example. At the same time, we know that the adversary tempts all of us to be unkind. And there are still many examples of this, even among children and youth. Persistent unkindness is known by many names, such as bullying, ganging up on someone, or joining others to joining together to reject others. These examples deliberately inflict pain on classmates or friends. My young sisters, it is not pleasing to the Lord if we are cruel or mean to others. Here is an example. I know of a young man, a refugee here in Utah, who was teased for being different, including sometimes speaking his native language. He was persecuted by a gang of privileged youth until he retaliated in a way that caused him to be jailed for over 70 days while being considered for deportation. I don't know what provoked this group of youth, many of them Latter-day Saints like you, but I can see the effect of their meanness, a tragic experience and expense to one of the children of God. Small actions of unkindness can have devastating consequences. When I heard that story, I compared it with what our prophet, President Nelson, said in his recent worldwide youth devotional. In asking you and all other youth to assist in gathering Israel, he said, stand out, be different from the world. You and I know that you are to be a light to the world, he said. Therefore, the Lord needs you to look like, sound like, act like, and dress like a true disciple of Jesus Christ." End of quote. The youth battalion President Nelson invited you to join will not be mean to one another. They will follow the Savior's teaching to reach out and be loving and considerate of others, even to turn the other cheek when we feel someone has wronged us. In a general conference address about the time many of you were born, President Gordon B. Hinckley praised, quote, beautiful young women who are striving to live the gospel. He described them just as I feel to describe you. Quote, they are generous toward one another. They seek to strengthen one another. They are a credit to their parents and the homes from which they come. 
They are approaching womanhood and will carry throughout their lives the ideals which presently motivate them." End of quote. As a servant of the Lord, I say to you young women, our world needs your goodness and love. Be kind to one another. Jesus taught us to love one another and to treat others as we want to be treated. As we strive to be kind, we draw closer to him and his loving influence. My dear sisters, if you participate in any meanness or pettiness, individually or with a group, resolve now to change and encourage others to change. That is my counsel, and I give it to you as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ because his spirit has prompted me to speak to you about this important subject. I testify of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to love one another as he loved us. I pray that we will do so in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Dear sisters, we express our sincere appreciation to each of you for sharing this evening with us. We thank the choir and all others for their participation and gratefully acknowledge those who have assisted in preparing for this meeting in any way. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following President Nelson's remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, We'll Bring the World His Truth. The benediction will then be offered by Sister Jennifer Free, who serves on the primary general board. It is wonderful to be with you, my dear and precious sisters. Perhaps a recent experience will give you a glimpse into how I feel about you. Your supernal abilities and separate you from the rest of the world. You are endowed with such extraordinary capacity. Well, by way of confession, I'll say that one day, while I was speaking to a congregation in South America, I became exceedingly excited about my topic. And at a pivotal moment, I said, as the mother of 10 children, I can tell you that. <laughs> and then I went on to complete my message. I did not realize that I had said the word mother. My translator, assuming I had misspoken, changed the word mother to father, so the congregation never knew that I had referred to myself <laughs> as mother. But my wife, Wendy, heard it, and she was delighted with my Freudian slip. <clears throat> in that moment, the deep longing of my heart to make a difference in the world, like only a mother does, bubbled up from my heart. Through the years, whenever I have been asked why I chose to become a medical doctor, my answer was always the same, because I could not choose to be a mother. Please note that any time I use the word mother, I'm not only talking about women who have given birth or adopted children in this life. I'm speaking about all of our heavenly parents' adult daughters. Every woman is a mother by virtue of her eternal divine destiny. So tonight, as the father of 10 children, father of 10 children, <laughs> nine daughters and one son, and as president of the church, I pray that you will sense how deeply I feel about you, about who you are and all the good you can do. No one else can do what a righteous woman can do. No one can duplicate the influence of a mother. 
Men can and often do communicate the love of Heavenly Father and the Savior to others. But women have a special gift for it, a divine endowment. You have the capacity to sense what someone needs and when they need it. You can reach out, comfort, teach, and strengthen someone in his or her very moment of need. Women see things differently than men do. And oh, how we need your perspective. Your nature leads you to think of others first, to consider the effect that any course of action will have on others. As President Eyring has pointed out, it was our glorious Mother Eve, with her far-reaching vision of our Heavenly Father's plan, who initiated what we call the Fall. Her wise and courageous choice and Adam's supporting decision moved God's plan of happiness forward. They made it possible for each of us to come to Earth to receive a body and prove that we would choose to stand up for Jesus Christ now, just as we did pre-mortally. My dear sisters, you have special spiritual gifts and propensities. Tonight, I urge you with all the hope of my heart to pray to understand your spiritual gifts, to cultivate, use, and expand them even more than you ever have. You will change the world as you do so. As women, you inspire others and set a standard worthy of emulation. Let me give you a little background on two of the major announcements made at our last general conference. You, my dear sisters, were key to each. First, ministering. The supreme standard for ministering is that of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Generally, women are and always have been closer to that standard than men. When you are truly ministering, you follow your feelings to help someone else experience more of the Savior's love. The inclination to minister is inherent in righteous women. I know women who pray every day. Whom wouldst thou have me help today? Before the April 2018 announcement about the higher and holier way of caring for others, the tendency of some men was to check off their home teaching assignment as done and move on to the next task. But when you sensed that a sister you were visiting teaching needed help, you responded immediately and then throughout the month. Thus it was how you visit taught that inspired our upward shift to ministering. Second, in the last general conference, we also restructured Melchizedek priesthood quorums. When we wrestled with how to help the men of the Church be more effective in their responsibilities, we carefully considered the example of the Relief Society. In Relief Society, Women in various ages and stages of life meet together. Each decade of life brings unique challenges. And yet, there you were, week after week, mingling together, growing and teaching the gospel together, and making a real difference in the world. Now, following your example, Melchizedek priesthood bearers are members of the Elders Quorum. These men range in age from 18 to 98, maybe more, with equally wide-ranging priesthood and church experiences. These brethren can now create stronger fraternal linkages, learn together, and bless others more effectively. You remember last June, Sister Nelson and I spoke to the youth of the Church. 
we invited them to enlist in the Lord's Youth Battalion to help gather Israel on both sides of the veil. This gathering is the greatest challenge and the greatest cause and the greatest work on earth today. It is a cause that desperately needs women because women shape the future. So tonight I extending a prophetic plea to you, the women of the church, to shape the future by helping to gather scattered Israel. Where can you start? May I offer four invitations? First, I invite you to participate in a 10-day fast from social media and from any other media that bring negative and impure thoughts to your mind. Pray to know which influences to remove during your fast. The effect of your 10-day fast may surprise you. What do you notice after taking a break from perspectives of the world that have been wounding your spirit? Is there a change in where you now want to spend your time and energy? Have any of your priorities shifted just a little? I urge you to record and follow through with each impression. Second, I invite you to read the Book of Mormon between now and the end of the year. As impossible as that may seem with all you're trying to manage in your life, if you will accept this invitation with full purpose of heart, the Lord will help you find a way to achieve it. And as you prayerfully study, I promise that the heavens will open for you. The Lord will bless you with increased inspiration and revelation. As you read, I would encourage you to mark each verse that speaks of or refers to the Savior. Then be intentional about talking of Christ, rejoicing in Christ, and preaching of Christ with your families and friends. You and they will be drawn closer to the Savior through this process and changes, even miracles will begin to happen. This morning, the announcement was made regarding the new Sunday school, uh, Sunday schedule and home-centered church-supported curriculum. As has been taught here tonight, you, my dear sisters, are a key to the success of this new balanced and coordinated gospel teaching effort. Please teach those whom you love what you are learning from the scriptures. Teach them how to turn to the Savior for his healing and cleansing power when they sin. And teach them how to draw upon his strengthening power every day of their lives. <clears throat> Third, establish a pattern of regular temple attendance. This may require a little more sacrifice in your life. More regular time in the temple will allow, will allow the Lord to teach you how to draw upon his priesthood power with which you have been endowed in his temple. Now, for those of you who don't live near a temple, I invite you to study prayerfully about temples in the scriptures and in the words of living prophets. Seek to know more, to understand more, to feel more about temples than you ever have before. In our worldwide youth devotional last June, I spoke about a young man whose life changed when his parents exchanged his smartphone for a flip phone. <laughs> this young man's mother is a fearless woman of faith. <laughs> she saw her son drifting toward choices that could prevent him from serving a mission. She took her pleadings to the temple. 
to know how best to help her son. Then she followed through with every impression. She said, and I quote, I felt the Spirit guiding me to check my son's phone at specific times to catch specific things. I don't know how to navigate these smartphones, but the Spirit guided me through all the social media that I don't even use. I know the Spirit helps parents who are seeking guidance to protect their children. At first, my son was furious with me, but after only three days, he thanked me. He could feel the difference." Close quote. Her son's behavior and attitudes changed dramatically. He became more helpful at home, smiled more, and was more attentive at church. He loved serving for a time in a temple baptistry and preparing for his mission. My fourth invitation for you who are of age is to participate fully in Relief Society. I urge you to study the current Relief Society purpose statement. It is inspiring. It may guide you in developing your own purpose statement for your own life. I also entreat you to savor the truths in the Relief Society Declaration, published almost 20 years ago. A framed copy of this declaration hangs on the wall in the office of the First Presidency. I am thrilled every time I read it. It describes who you are and who the Lord needs you to be at this precise time as you do your part to help gather scattered Israel. My dear sisters, we need you. We need your strength, your conversion, your conviction, your ability to lead, your wisdom, and your voices. We simply cannot gather Israel without you. I love you and thank you and now bless you with the ability to leave the world behind as you assist in this crucial and urgent work. Together we can do all that our Heavenly Father needs us to do to prepare the world for the second coming of his beloved Son. Jesus is the Christ. This is his church. Of this I testify. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful to be gathered together as thy daughters throughout the world, unified in our desire to understand thy plan for us. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be able to have heard from our priesthood and sister leaders in the Church. We're grateful for their messages and for the spirit that we have felt, for the things that we have learned and we were taught. Heavenly Father, we know that Thy Son leads this Church and does so through a living prophet. We are so thankful to know and understand the blessing of having a living prophet today. And we're thankful for President Nelson and pray that we will be able to have the courage and strength and desire to implement the counsel that we have received. Heavenly Father, we desire to continue on the covenant path which we know leads us closer to Thy Son. We pray that Thou would help us, that Thou elevate our thoughts, our desires, and our actions, that we may always be worthy to have His Spirit to be with us. At this time, at the conclusion of this session, we pray, Heavenly Father, that as we return to our homes, that we will be able to be prepared to strengthen our families, to strengthen our wards, our neighborhoods, and our communities as we love and serve and take care of one another. For our many blessings, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. We love Thee, we love Thy Son, and we ask for Thy blessings to continue with us and all of those that we love, and do so in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>